Okay, thank you everybody for being here. Uh, this is actually a pleasure uh, to be part of this community and to be presented. Um, so we're gonna talk about uh, deploying production ready OpenStack on Kubernetes. You may hear uh, a lot about this. So today we're gonna have a different approach. We're gonna talk about the operator side, the user side. So we work for Wordig. It's a company, a SaaS company, so what as a service. We have um, human resources, capital, and financial applications. Uh, practically um, all Wordig uh, users, they actually run through VMs that are powered by OpenStack. We run uh, over 1,000 servers with OpenStack in five different um, data centers, all distributed. And so we are very happy of um, our achievements running OpenStack. We don't run any, any kind of distribution. We don't, we don't have any kind of support. Our engineering team has done a lot of the work. And uh, today we're gonna talk about our next steps, right? What's gonna happen with the control plane and how we're gonna incorporate this concept of uh, uh, the containerization of the, of the control plane. So let's, uh, let me introduce myself and my colleague. Uh, so my name is Edgar Megana. I've been part of the community since uh, 2011. I've uh, been attending all these uh, summits. I started it back in, in Santa Clara, so this is, this is uh, a great journey for me. I've been part of the OpenStack uh, Board of Directors, and currently I'm chair of the uh, user committee. Uh, at Worday, I'm the cloud operations architect. I've been uh, helping the team to actually go all the way to production with OpenStack. So um, I'm, I'm, again, very, very happy of where we are right now. Hi, my name is Imtiaz Choudhury. I'm a principal engineer at Workday. I've been at Workday's cloud uh, engineering team from almost the beginning for the last four years. Uh, we started with no cloud, and now we have the big deployment, as Edgar was pointing out. Uh, before joining Workday, I was at Cisco, where I worked on various roles on network management and, and other, like, different teams. So today, uh, what we will cover is uh, what is the problem that we are trying to solve. Um, we have a big, uh, well, decent deployment. It's not as big as AT&T, but we have over... 50,000 core running in our five different data centers, and uh, it, it's growing. So that's how do we want to scale our OpenStack deployment? We need to make our OpenStack deployment very secure and production ready. So you'll hear a lot about deploying OpenStack, but it's sometimes easy to deploy OpenStack, but it, there are other challenges to make it enterprise ready. So we'll cover like what are some of the security requirements that we have and how do we address that using the tools that we have. Then building a continuous integration and uh, deployment pipeline. And everything that we have done so far, it's fully automated and we do it in a way that developers can make changes and deploy it all the way to production after getting it thoroughly tested. So we, we, this is one of the requirements and we'll cover like how we achieve that. We also want to make sure that the OpenStack deployment that we have, all the services are available and we can upgrade with zero downtime or do maintenance with zero downtime. And finally, we'll cover some of the lessons learned in this whole uh, initiative that we tried and we'll save the last 10 minutes for any questions and answers that you may have. So first uh, point, what is the problem that we are trying to solve? So we are trying to build a, a highly available and reliable OpenStack uh, services. And th that means, and deploying a highly available cluster is not simple. It, uh, the, it's very distributed. There are many different components. You have uh, uh, stateful services, stateless services, and like it includes many different uh, like different components that you have to manage and orchestrate the deployment order. And it, it, it is a non-trivial non problem. Then, so we want to simplify, like when we go to the highly available model, how you can deploy a HA cluster with, by keeping the deployment model as simple as possible. Then, as I mentioned, continuous integration and deployment is, oh, sorry, oops. Oh, 
so sorry. So then the things that we have to do, uh, OK, for to make our cluster secure, uh, like OpenStack deployment, like so what are some of the things that we need to do to make it production ready and to make it enterprise grade? So some of the requirements that we have is to make uh, all the communication for all services uh, over SSL. So SSL has to be terminated on every ad service endpoints. We need to also make sure that the, we have authentication and enable uh, authorization with our centralized LDAP services. So these are some things that you don't get with off-the-shelf OpenStack solution. I mean, the, all these options are supported, but you have to customize your deployment to add this functionality. Credential management. So we've seen different deployment models, but what many of them don't support or you have to at least take care of is to ensure all the service level credentials are encrypted and they're, they are not present in any clear text form anywhere. So these are some of the security requirements that we have uh, and we try to strictly adhere to. For example, OpenStack service API endpoint, uh, service users and passwords, you cannot keep them like in clear text anywhere. Uh, so, and uh, as we are continuizing the services, the other thing that we have to make sure for our purpose is to make sure we can scan all the container images and make sure they don't have any OS vulnerabilities or any known vulnerabilities. So that's another requirement that we have. And not only that, all these container images, which you can sometimes find, find in like GitHub or some other like, uh, source, uh, repositories, uh, we cannot, for our enterprise, like take anything from internet. We have to build everything internally within our data center with no access to the internet. So that does that additional challenge, and uh, I'll get to like how we address that to more detail. But that's one of the requirements. And also, we ha have a requirement to have everything, like logging and monitoring, uh, to centralized uh, platform that we have. And finally, everything that we have to do has to meet our performance uh, SLA. So we have some strict requirements of how many VMs we need to provision within a given time, uh, how many requests we can handle. We establish some performance SLA with uh, the consumers of like Workday private cloud, and we try to strictly adhere to those requirements. So before we move forward, I would like just to make a, a little bit of a stop here and uh, talk about our architecture. So we're not doing anything crazy. We have the typical reference architecture for OpenStack. We have, uh, we just make a little bit changes because we believe it makes sense. So uh, normally you have uh, the OpenStack controller, so known, uh, with all the OpenStack uh, uh, projects, the core projects, uh, Keystone, Nova, et cetera and the database and all those kind of things. So we just decided to actually abstract out the, um, the stateful services and build something that we call like infra server for our OpenStack deployment. It's with uh, MariaDB is actually running with the Galera replication. Uh, we have Cassandra because we use OpenControl as our SDN solution. We have Zookeeper, which is also needed for OpenControl. And then uh, we set it up Rabbit NQ uh, with HAQs across uh, the three or more uh, OpenStack controllers. And then uh, every compute node that you're running, the Nova compute and the, and the build router for, uh, for OpenStack. So nothing, nothing extraordinary, but, um, but in the security part and the production readiness is super important, the uh, requirements that actually Imp just mentioned, because we manage human resources information. Uh, our customers, we have like uh, uh, contracts, we have to have certain policies on uh, the workloads that we run. And we're a, we a multi-tenant environment. So we have two customers that they potentially are competitors. So we have to guarantee isolation, east, west, north, south traffic. So our security team actually, they go under the scope, every single uh, communication and everything that is actually 
happening in our OpenStack deployments. Even the password for OpenStack for all the single deployments and all the single things that we have in, in our cluster, right? The, the, the MariaDB uh, pa uh, password, the Zookeeper, the credentials for RabbitMQ, et cetera. And everything has to be super protected. So, and, and this is what we wanted to talk about this because when you have all these requirements that you wanted to go to production, it's not a couple of days project. It actually takes a, li a little bit more and takes a little bit more uh, effort. So um, moving to the containers, we believe it's gonna give us a little bit more spa, uh, speed and actually we give us more flexibility on doing upgrades and, and other stuff. So uh, let's talk about uh, the next. Um, Gone all of, already over the security. So, so now that, like, yeah, I talked about some of the requirements that we have. So the next thing is how, given those are the requirements, how do we address, like, those challenges? And so one thing that I mentioned is we want to bring a build a highly available OpenStack uh, cluster. And one of the ways, like, I mean, we, right now the architecture that Edgar showed is what we have. This is what we are building on bare metal machines, and it's. Uh, like using, we use Chef for that, but we are trying to move into more containerized uh, approach. And one way of getting that done is to containerize each services. And you've heard in the previous session, those of you attended, and maybe some other sessions, so that what we noticed, like building the highly available part, like we, we want to achieve that architecture that uh, we showed in the previous slide, but we want to containerize each services so you can easily deploy those things, and one of the challenges of that architecture, as I mentioned, is, is the, the deployment order. So for example, first we need to bring, build a, the infrastructure services. You need to build a three-node Galera cluster. You need to build load balancers. You need to have a, a RabbitMQ. The, the order of deployment in each of the uh, services deployment matters, and it's not trivial. So the orchestration, you can deploy come up with your own orchestration uh, engine, or you can use something out of the box. So we felt like Kubernetes is one container orchestration tool that can address this problem. Continuous integration and deployment. Uh, we ended up building our own continuous integration and deployment, uh, uh, but we took advantage of uh, several OpenStack projects, including Cola and OpenStack Helm. Zero downtime upgrade. Again, using OpenStack Helm uh, or Helm actually lets you upgrade from one OpenStack release to another, or even if you have minor like bug fixes. Uh, we are, at this point, we are taking advantage of Kubernetes' like, inherent features of doing uh, A-B upgrade. So this is another thing that you can achieve, uh, or we felt like these are the tools that help address some of the issues that we are trying to resolve. So, and, how do we also scale our applications? As I mentioned, like our, we have uh, services running on our current OpenStack uh, installation, but uh, we are onboarding more and more work the services into this private cloud that we have. And with that growing, uh, uh, with that growth has a growing need for scaling our services. And once you can containerize, it makes some of the scaling of the application or the API layer much easier. And finally, reducing time to create and apply hot patches. This is another thing like we wanted to, we do very often, we have to make changes and roll it out into production. And we wanna reduce the time it takes to do that. And these are some of the operator's challenges that we face. And one of the things uh, that we found challenging is how many releases uh, OpenStack as a community been uh, re releasing every year. So that's usually two, and last year I believe it was three. And in, as operators, it's challenging for us to keep up with all the changes. But sometimes, even when we try to check a minor bug, like uh, if we want to pick up a critical bug fix, it, it is challenging for us to just uh, take the bug fix, rebuild a uh, package, and roll it out. And Cola and Helm, I'll go into detail, but helps us address uh, some of those problems. I, I would like to add on something, right? There is no final deployment of OpenStack. It's not like, oh, we get all the configuration file, it's going there, it's in production, we're done. Let's move on to the next project. It's not like that. We actually keep 
changing configuration files, we keep improving. We receive feedback from our customers, the, the um, response time for our APIs. We keep learning, no, we need to add more workers for this API, we need to reduce this, we need to change that. So we need to have a system that, a system that is flexible enough to update all these configuration files, all these changes, and keeps with settle down time for our customers. So, so what are some of the deployment uh, options that we have? Uh, so as I mentioned, like we use, for building container images, we used uh, Cola for creating the images. And Cola gives you several options. One is Ansible, uh, another is Kubernetes. Like once you build a Docker container images. So the, we evaluated, there are, uh, these are just few options. I'm sure like there are other options that are out there. We looked at Ansible and uh, Kubernetes. With Ansible, we felt like the air entry to barrier is not too much. It, you can easily deploy container images on uh, bare metal or VM. Um, there isn't a whole lot of support for doing rolling upgrade or scaling. So that was our requirement, and we tried to see how it can be done. For example, like if you're doing weekly maintenance, the Ansible scripts that are currently available, it'll help you deploy the first cluster but if you want to do rolling upgrade, shut down one controller, upgrade and bring up another one, some of these features were not built in. Uh, requiring uh, oh, the sequence management, as I was trying to highlight, like all the, in OpenStack Ansible projects, it does, you can, there are ways you can customize passwords or you can use a third party tool to uh, keep up, manage all your secrets, but it doesn't come with the solution, and you have to find something. And as is, it's a very highly opinionated about how the deployment should be, and we wanted to have more flexibility. Uh, so Kubernetes, we felt like in some ways it has higher barrier to entry in the way that you actually have to have a Kubernetes cluster present first before you can deploy, so that itself is a challenge. And I think that's been already highlighted by some of the previous speakers. And, but once you have that, it does give you the flexibility to like grow and, uh, it, and also make future changes. Okay, so our approach was to build like OpenStack containers. So based on these requirements and the tools and everything that we described, we are, Yeah, so we, are, we used OpenStack Cola to containerize each of the OpenStack services, the Keystone, Nova, Glance, and each of the services. And then we use a deployment tool like OpenStack Helm to provision it on a Kubernetes cluster. So the continuous integration pipeline. So how did we build that? So OpenStack Cola is a great project for building container images, but we had to do a a number of customizations. First of all, we wanted to build it using CentOS operating system and our OS supported by our infrastructure, where the infrastructure and security is CentOS 7, I mean, for this particular project. So we uh, took the Color project, we use a CentOS 7 base image that's created internally in our data center, blessed by security, going through, and it goes through like, uh, OS security scan, and once that's done, we take that base image and use Cola to create uh, all the OpenStack services. The Cola has the service definitions, and the, uh, it's a templating thing. It takes, creates a Docker file and generates the ultimate uh, Docker image. But uh, the binaries here also, we take everything from our local YUM repository, or I mean, the Ubuntu version would be an apt but for our case, we have YAM repository for, from where all the binaries come from, and Cola simply takes the binaries from there, takes the base image from our CentOS uh, base image that we created, and we keep our image, Docker images in the artifactory. I mean, there are different Docker registry you can use. For our case, we use the JFrogs artifactory, and once the images are created, we publish it in, uh, again back into Artifactory. And this is a continuous process if we want to make changes 
to any customize or customize these images, we can make change to the repository and create a new container image, push it back into Artifactory. And from there, we are, our CI pipeline actually does a full deployment of the OpenStack uh, using these images, and it will run Tempest test to validate that uh, the cluster functionality, like it's functioning as expected. Like you have, we haven't broken any of the deployment tools. And once that's done, uh, we usually roll out those changes into production. So this is how the continuous integration pipeline works, and we, this is how we built our, the con CI pipeline around using Cola. And one thing, the, the Artifactory has a geo-replication, so all our data centers will replicate, and then actually will have exactly the same version of the containers image that we're gonna use in every single of the deployments. So we actually ended up deploying two OpenStack clusters per data centers. We try to mimic the, the Amazon concept of availability zones, and this is why we need to have this continuous integration process as a, a, a cookie courier process because we need to have identical OpenStack clusters because our operations teams, they need to know uh, what's the uh, troubleshooting uh, process for all of them, and it's, n it's not gonna be like each one of them is gonna be different. They have to be exactly the same. Yeah, thanks, Edgar, for pointing that out. And it is very important that all the clusters are identical and they can be managed. It's very predictable uh, the way they are deployed. And so the deploying with OpenStack Helm, so again, like once uh, all the container images are created using Cola, we put, push them in Artifactory, and once we have those images, Helm is one of the new project, well, OpenStack Helm, that uses Helm, to take all these con container artifacts, and we can customize the values for any customization that we need to do, and deploy it on uh, Kubernetes cluster. So what are some of the customizations that we do? This is for hardening security. For example, if you wanna enable SSL on Keystone endpoint, and one of the good things about Cola is, uh, and Helm, you can abstract some of those configuration parameters outside and keep them separately. And these are the custom chart values that you can set up separately. And we can change the number of API workers, enable SSL, integrate with LDAP. All those things are relatively sim simple to just take out as configuration parameters and inject into the image. And then you simply deployed on a Kubernetes cluster. So what are some of the lessons learned? So first, I'll go through the good things. So one of the uh, great things about the Cola project that we appreciate is uh, its ability to build from source. And what that means is we, can, we have the option to build either from uh, like packages or from like upstream source which can, we can have a local copy of. And why is this important? Once in a while, we run into issues where we need a fix, which is only maybe fixed in the latest release, and we probably need a few line of code changes. If we try to get all the RPM packages or Python packages, uh, it's very difficult to just uh, get that because usually those packages have dependencies, and it's hard to like build an RPM package on our own or like it's a complex process. It, it can be done, but it adds complexity. With this option to build from source, we can cherry pick if needed certain changes, have its security reviewed, change, uh, uh, submit the code, have a new Im container image created with color project without having to manage like an RPM build pipeline or something like that. And we already, as I explained, we have a continuous integration and deployment pipeline. So once we create a new image, from the source, uh, like uh, it can be easily like tested in, in our uh, CI/CD pipeline and then deployed. So that's one of the good uh, thing about uh, like being able to build from source, uh, creating and applying hot patches. So again, uh, to build on what I was just saying, so if you can cherry pick changes, you can deploy and uh, and with the Kubernetes model, you create new images. And with Helm, you can say, I want to deploy this version. And it, it is very easy to apply hot patches without having to go through complex uh, cycles. Uh, orchestration tool. Uh, since Kubernetes has a pretty sophisticated orchestration model, uh, you don't need to build anything on your own. 
uh, for deploying an uh, HA type of a, a cluster. So that, that's a big plus. Easy to deploy and upgrade. Again, comes out of, uh, these are some features from Kubernetes and uh, changing, if you need to make a change in just a keystone, it's easy to take a new container image and deploy it. If we were to do it without having a containerized model, you'd may, you may have to get newer version of Python or like some packages, again, which may have other dependencies. And those, those type of changes are sometimes very hard to roll out in production in a consistent manner. And you cannot uninstall sometimes an existing package without having any service disruption. And that, that's something we cannot like, afford to do in a, like, a big production system. Relatively easy to customize. With Cola and Helm, as I was saying, you can abstract a lot of the configuration parameters separately. Helm lets you manage configuration and the software versioning. And those are very, that makes the uh, management and deployment uh, of different versions and different releases very easy. Secrets management is another thing that we get for free with Kubernetes. Kubernetes has its own secret management, so you don't need to look for something like Vault or some other solution. And deploying, so far our experience was like with this model, deployment becomes quite easy. In fact, uh, this whole project was uh, done uh, by one yeah, of our- Yeah, you can say it, you can say it, it's <laughs> <Yeah>. an intern. <laughs> Yeah, like I can say like even an intern can do it. Like one of our interns over the summer deployed the whole OpenStack cluster on Kubernetes. So it can be easy. Yeah, but adding some of those things, yeah. Uh, there are some details we, we sorted, had to sort out, but yeah, the overall process is, becomes quite easy. That, that, was, that was the goal to come here, right? To tell you from the operators, from the user experience, what's really the project about. So you hear a lot about the developers, and obviously the developers, they need to talk highly about the products. But now that we try the product, we can really tell you that actually, intentionally, we say, okay, we have three months project for an intern. What if we give it this project today and see what happened? And actually, that was an amazing experience, uh, ramping up very quickly. And that person didn't even have experience on OpenStax, which was great. And then the, some of the bad parts. <laughs> so all these technologies are very fast evolving. Ever since we tried it out in summer, and between then and now, a lot of things have changed. Like if we are to try the same thing again, a lot of the issues we ran into are no longer there in some ways. But at the same time, we need, like we, the current version requires a newer version of Docker. You need a newer version of Helm. Everything has very version dependency and it's evolving very fast. So I, I would, like anyone who wants to venture in this thing area, I would give you a cautionary note that you have to be aware that th these things are moving very fast in a good direction, but that's something you have to be aware of. OpenStack Helm project is still under heavy development, a lot of, and it's changing very fast and that's again a very good thing, but uh, you'll still see there are a lot of issues and the documentation sometimes it's not quite, uh, it cannot keep up to the pace at which uh, things are changing. Uh, persistent volume support, that's another thing that uh, we need to do in order to have any stateful services to, uh, like Galera or RabbitMQ. Um, and we found like in order to do that, uh, Ceph is one of the options. And the support for Ceph with uh, OpenStack Helm and some of these tools there are some challenges, like uh, it's, there are some known issues and bugs. It doesn't, it works, but you have to make some customizations. Uh, so that, that, that was a challenging point, like when we tried to do that. And uh, oh, limited support for a role-based access control. So Helm is cool, you can uh, deploy an application, but again, when you bring up security and other concerns, uh, what if, Right now, it doesn't have any authentication or authorization mechanism, so that means someone who has access can deploy a new version or rollback. Uh, so, and from a security point of view, you can say, like, who did that? You, you will have no trace of who upgraded an entire data center OpenStack cluster <laughs> using Helm. So you have, like, I think that's a feature that uh, the, that community is working on, but right now, it's uh, missing. Now some of the ugly part. Uh, 
So the managing the whole overlay and underlay networking is uh, non-trivial. Like, and this is I'm talking about the Kubernetes doing uh, networking for Kubernetes. There are many options. You can use Calico, Weave, Contrail. Uh, I don't know if Edgar wants to like add anything to it. Is the more passionate about networking. Oh, or, or just because I'm the ugly. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I really like networking. I, I participate in some of the neutron designs and things like that. And, and uh, so you just bring more complexity to your system, right? You try to simplify a problem and you create another project, another problem, sorry, which is just the coordinators by itself support. It needs to have a certain level of, of HA, right? And, and you heard about these Kubernetes uh, architecture and everyone describes it as a simple, very simple architecture, but still you have a persistent layer, you have an API layer, you have a proxy layer for the networking. So you already have four, five, six different components that you actually have to manage. What happens if the proxy or the kubelet or some of those components goes down? Then some, something on your control plane or your open stack will be down. So um, are you gonna build the, the, the HA for the Kubernetes in three clusters? So, those are the things that we are trying to figure it out now. Um, our layer tree network in, in our data center, our uh, underlay network is a pure layer tree. So all these tracks, they don't have a L2 connectivity between each other. So it makes a, a little bit difficult if you have to have any kind of protocol to recur some broadcast between these two racks. And if you put it inside of the same rack, you end up having a single pole of failure in that rack, even that you had two top of the rack switches for that uh, the right back. But we're trying to design things that actually are so distributed that a whole rack failure will not affect the system. Um, building, uh, building all the systems inside of the other overlay network, right? For the open stack, we, as I said at the beginning, we use uh, open control. Uh, the decision to use open control is because we really like the way um, the policy framework was, was extended. We wanted to use NFP and other functions, so that was a very good fit for our underlay, especially on the layer tree. Uh, the build router is um, um, a BGP uh, automatic, uh, uh, just the BGP protocol to actually communicate with the other uh, build router, so actually, again, fits perfectly. But again, then you have to have one uh, underlay networking, one overlay, and then the other one for the Kubernetes. So those things are becoming some, some complicated. So it's ugly. And why, why it's ugly? Because we need to present this to the info operation thing. Something that Intius and I, we haven't said is, as a part of the development team, we don't manage these clusters. We actually deliver this as a product to our infrastructure operations team, and they take care of that. So we can actually connect to those OpenStack clusters because we don't even know the credentials for those systems. We don't have even access to those, to those servers. So that's, that's when it's becoming complicated. And um, we have to have persistent volume set up for, for both systems. So we're exploring uh, different options. We have uh, in the past Ceph, and now we're extending to um, um, maybe using not just for object storage, but also for uh, block storage as well. So, yeah, uh, so we're getting close to the time that we wanted to left for questions. So the next thing is, um, so we actually publish a lot of work that we have done um, at Word Day. Again, so we like to share as much as possible. We like to find another operators that are struggling at the same phase that we are. Most of um, our production system are still in running OpenStack control plane direct on bare metal. So we're doing this transition. Transition, sorry, we're gonna learn more and we're gonna get more experience on running the control plane in production in all the data centers. So if you're curious about what we have done so far and uh, where we are, so we, the, we published this in the Super User Magazine, this uh, OpenStack delivers services to thousands of worthy customers because in um, nowadays, 100% um, of the worthy customers, 100% of them, they actually go through and open stack based uh, uh, virtual machines, all of them. So that's, that's actually very cool and everything is published there. Tomorrow we're gonna talk a little bit in the afternoon around 3.10 is a session about performance metric. We actually uh, use Rally at the max extent. We actually extend some of the use cases to find out uh, what is the best um, uh, configuration for your cloud and we actually run things like, okay, let's run thousands of VMs in, um, in, in these clusters and find out uh, how many of them actually they come up and, and how we find out 
um, um, the, the performance value. So tomorrow we're gonna talk about that. And so we're good, right? So yeah. that's um, yeah. open up for questions. I, I can I questions to you actually. So the question is, um, explain a little bit more the use case about the uh, SSL in our clusters, uh, where the encryption is happening and why is that requirement? So you work on that, so I'll let you take that. So for SSL encryption right now, yeah, it can be done at two different places, at a load balancer or at the endpoints. For our current HA architecture, we are terminating SSL at the endpoints and for the load balancer is just a pass through. The reason because of that is our security requirement is um, any communication who goes from a physical service to another physical service should be encrypted. If our load balancer were running inside of the same server that the rest of the OpenStack components, we could actually have terminated there, but no, because it's in a different uh, physical uh, server. And why is that? Uh, because the low balancer, we're using HA proxy with keep alive, and because they need a broadcast domain, if you remember what we're saying about the layer three per rack, we actually have to have uh, two racks that they extend the broadcast domain between each other. They actually, we have the two low balancers um, in, that, in, the, in, in those two racks, and they can actually talk, uh, the keep alive will actually talk between them. Thank you for the question. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, a short one. Uh, you talk about higher availability, but what kind of higher availability? Like nine point nine percent or in nine or nine point nine? The question is, uh, we talk about high availability. Uh, what kind of high availability you're talking about? Ninety nine point nine and 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 so forth. Um, so our requirement is to not have a single point of failure, right? Our SLA with our internal customers, just remember, this is a private cloud, it's not a public cloud. What's, what's the difference? So we control, to a certain extent, when we create the, the virtual machines, right? Where the control plane is happening. At what did we have a maintenance window of two hours with our production customers? So we have two hours where we could potentially have a downtime. So every patch, every day, could happen in those ones. Uh, for so many, Months that that been in production, we haven't had any 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 uh, issue, any downtime. Uh, so our requirement is to go to 99.99. 99. Uh, if I go back from the very beginning, we we're not close to that because at the beginning it was a little bit bumpy and we have some issues. If I go back to the last uh, six eight months, probably we were around 90 90 percent of uh, uptime. One more? Okay, let's go for beer. Thank oh, you so much. There was oh, that sorry. one at the end. It's so difficult sometimes yeah, to hear. I think very end. Yeah. All, all. Could you, could you uh, repeat the question a little bit louder? Our application layer, uh, nothing. It's our own product, right? It's, it's world product. None of our applications is obviously open source. It's, it's the world, the world product is what the company is about. So I'm sorry, the question was, uh, what about the, the application layer? How much is uh, uh, open source? And I already answered. Yeah, everything built up to OpenStack is open source, right. and Open Contrail is an, also an open source project. So all the tools and everything that we use uh, to provide infrastructure as a service is open source, right? Um, but the application that we run on the top of that infrastructure is, is where the problem. There was some question here. Yes. About not using which one? So the question was, how, how challenged is to operate an OpenStack cluster compared with? Kubernetes. There's... With a Kubernetes cluster? I didn't get the question very well, sorry. Did you? Operating OpenStack clusters before the past? 
in, at Worday. So uh, the transitions that we did, we have a, a hybrid solution in the past. Most of our applications were running on, on bare metal directly. So we were using Chef to actually do uh, rolling upgrades and all configuration management. Uh, uh, very few sections was already virtualized with send servers. And we actually uh, start moving as, as much as possible application to be uh, uh, as an image into the OpenStack deployment. So in the white paper that I was mentioning before, we mentioned, so we have already eight different applications running in production. We're going to have another web of application to be on board. It's a, it's a complicated process because we need to exactly know how much of the, um, our customers will be using those applications, and we need to calculate how many VMs we need for every, every service that is running. Okay? Now we go for beers. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks. Oh, we forgot to mention we are hiring both. Uh, like, if you are interested in uh, like our team and what we are doing, we have positions open in Pleasanton, California, and Dublin, Ireland. But there are more positions at work, David. I would like to. So, if you, you can reach out to us for any further questions or if you're interested to work at Workday. Thank you. Thanks.